This meeting is being recorded. Okay, everybody, welcome to Bible Study Genesis Class 1. So um, I am just kind of looking around and I'm going to name. It's a little tender to do this without Liz. So yes. I just maybe we just take a moment and just kind of hold some silence and love for her, if that would be okay. Amen. Mabel did her best to snore throughout that and contribute. <laughs> Liz would have loved that. Liz is a pug. Liz was a pug lady. So she always got a big kick out of seeing Mabel come. Okay, everybody, let's dive into Genesis. There's a lot on this one today. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to get us through everything I want to do today. It's a little ambitious. Um, but I want to start with a little thought on Genesis. This is from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who is just a wonderful rabbi. We can relate to its characters and their dilemmas. We are part of their world as they are part of ours. No other ancient literature has so contemporary a feel. This is our story. This is where we came from. This is our journey. We're going to turn to Rabbi Sachs multiple times as we work through Genesis, and I'll talk a little bit about why. Um, so this week we're going to do background and context. Y'all know I'm a big fan of that. And we're going to cover Genesis 1 and 2. Next week we'll take on Genesis 3 and 4, which is the story of Adam and Eve and the kids, a hard story. And then we'll head into the Great Flood. Then we'll head into Noah's Covenant. And then we'll um, come to chapter 11, where we're going to pause. Okay, this is a graph that if you've been in a class with me before, you all have seen critical markers in Israel's history. Um, Israel came together as a nation in the 700s. Um, the uh, one half of it split off um, and just one half of the kingdom remained. And that was um, overthrown by the Babylonians in 582. And this period from 582 and 538 is known as the Babylonian exile. It's when Babylon came in, destroyed the temple, ravaged Jerusalem, and took the elite back to Babylon as prisoners. Part of who they took were the scholars and the scribes and the clerics. And that's pretty important for the book of Genesis because it is during that time between 582 and 538 that the exiled Israeli Israelites wrote down um, the book of Genesis. So the book of Genesis is a story that covers about 2,400 years. It's the first book in the biblical canon. Now, tradition has it that this was written by Moses, and that Moses wrote not only Genesis, but all of the other four books of the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Um, we know that's not true, so this is just tradition. Within the Jewish tradition, Genesis and those four other books are considered the heart of the Bible, the Torah. And these four, these stories are incredibly formative in not just Christianity and Judaism, but also in Islam. We're going to hit that when we get to the second part of um, Genesis, when we deal with Abraham, because um, we're going to um, pick up the story elements in the Quran, very formative in the Quran. The book of Genesis was put together, not written, just written down in the fifth century during that Babylonian exile. The stories you find in Genesis are ancient, ancient stories. Originally, it was written down in Hebrew, and the earliest manuscripts then translated it into Greek. Uh, there is enormous debate over the source material uh, in Genesis in particular. Um, 
because um, many of the stories, particularly the creation stories, have interesting overlaps with other pagan creation stories. Um, so lots of lots of uh, scholarly debate over where these stories came from, but they were ancient stories. In the fifth century, the Israelites wrote them down. It's important when we get into Genesis to think about it not as a coherent book with a start and a finish. It's not that. Um, I would think of Genesis as a library. And in that library, there are going to be stories, there's going to be hymns, there's going to be sermons, there's going to be political statements, um, a collection of traditions. It's not a narrative start to end. Think of it as a diverse collection of literature. I like one of my favorite analogies is to think of Genesis as a medieval cathedral, which if you have ever been in a European medieval cathedral, you know they're kind of a mess architecturally, like cobbled together piece by piece. And sometimes they go together and sometimes they don't. But honestly, if you dim the lights and you put on some beautiful music, there's a gorgeous coherence with the look. So I think Genesis is a lot like that. Genesis is less about God and more about human relationship with God. Are the stories real? That picture on the right is actually a real picture of the Noah's Ark Museum um, in this country where people can go into the ark and they can see dinosaurs in the pens. Mm -hmm. um, are the stories real? They are not factually real, but they are real in the sense that they reveal real uh, ethical certainties concerning God and God's call for love and mercy and justice. Even when the heroes fall short and the heroes are going to fall very short in Genesis. Okay, what questions is Genesis trying to answer? These are the biggies. Uh, who are we as a people? Where do we come from? What's our origin? Are we alone or is there something greater than us? If there is something greater, is this the God of our people or a God that rules over all the other gods and all the other humans? Whose God does this belong to, right? Who is this God and what is this character of this God who we say we believe in? The big questions Genesis is going to grapple with. Typically, Genesis is read by Christians, by Christians, as a book that begins with this perfect creation, and then it rapidly deteriorates in this downward spiral. That's how Christians typically read Genesis. Mm -hmm. And this understanding fits into a thought theology that perceives the world as fundamentally evil due to the fall of humanity. That's the Christian narrative. That is not the Jewish narrative and that is not the, the um, understanding of many biblical scholars within Christianity. So instead, I'm gonna encourage you to put that aside. And instead, think about Genesis as a story of the testimony of the goodness of God's creation in spite of the shortcomings of humanity. So Genesis is a story like life filled with highs and lows, successes and failures, and those all give meaning. So instead of reading Genesis and looking for the fall, looking for um, the emergence of evil, I'm going to encourage you instead, look for the creator of all who is present and initiates blessing. God creates and it is good. So that's the lens with which we're going to look at, at Genesis. That means we're going to have to put aside um, a whole lot of our understandings of what we've been taught about Genesis. And we're going to have to... Um, really think about how we read the stories we're gonna read. Now, some of the stories we're gonna read, particularly in the second half, when we come to Abraham and some of the things him and his children will do, um, they're very troublesome. They're gonna support patriarchy, slavery, conquest, 
ethnic discrimination, genocide, and abuse. So we're going to see all of that. Um, uh, not so much in this one. We'll see some of it in the first half. But when we dive into Abraham and his kids' stories, we're definitely going to see that there. Okay. Why was Genesis written? <coughs> First and foremost, the stories of Genesis were written down by the Israelites by the when they were in the Babylonian captivity to tell the story of the Jewish God in contrast to the stories of all the gods that were surrounding their people. Okay, so that's the first reason it was written down. In a larger sense, it was written down to reveal who this God is that we claim to worship and who we are before this God. Um, Miguel uh, de la Torre is a wonderful scholar who um, we're going to look at some of his work as we dive into uh, Genesis. And, and this is an important reason also why Genesis was written. Regardless of the moral, spiritual, and ethical lessons that can be learned by reading Genesis, the reader should be mindful that one of the book's purposes is to provide moral justification or the eventual genocide of the promised land's original indigenous inhabitants as recorded in the book of Joshua. So what De, De La Torre is saying is, is that Genesis, and this is an important thing to be cognizant of, Genesis is gonna lay the groundwork for um, from the justification of, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and mute everybody, hold on. The justification, that um, is coming in terms of the Israelites taking over the land of the Canaanites. Okay, uh, we're gonna divide Genesis into two parts. Here's the first part. This is what we're gonna do between now and Christmas. And we're gonna do the first 11 chapters. This is kind of like the global universal cosmic events, the world being formed, we're going to deal with how humans, why humans die, why violence between humans occurs. We're going to deal with that with the story of Cain and Abel. We're going to talk about how the creator has the power to punish the wicked through the flood. And we're going to deal with why different language and cultures exist. So one of the last stories we'll come to You're not. before Christmas is the Tower of Babel. The second half. Um, and we'll start this in February, is really the stories of the patriarchs. This is going to focus on the history of the Jewish people and the stories of the first families. Um, and most scholars think this is not an accident, that this is all about uh, a family, because a family really is where we learn um, emotional, spiritual uh, intelligence. In the second half of Genesis, we are going to meet a radically personal God. This is the God that's going to show up knocking on Abraham's tent, wanting tea. This is the God that's going to be out in the desert with Hagar. Um, this is a God who hears prayers, senses suffering, and is incredibly active and present in their lives. So that is all to come in part two of Genesis. Okay, the characters we're going to encounter. Um, Genesis really doesn't pull any punches. They're portrayed with brutal realism, and there's a lot of warts on some of them. Um, Noah is a drunk. Abraham is going to pimp out his wife. He's going to sexually assault his slave. Um, Jacob is a liar and a deceiver. And all there's there's not a lot of good guys in this. Um, all are gonna, all the big characters are gonna fall short, and um, but they're all um, kind of being gonna be told, seen as um, uh, revealers of God's message. Okay, I'm gonna ask whoever is not on mute to go ahead and mute yourself. Yes, I can't get off of this. There you go. Okay. Let's dive in. Um, we're going to talk about Genesis 1. So um, one of the biggest challenges of the content we're about to see is um, that these are some of the most misunderstood uh, scriptures of the Bible. 
and um, it's very hard to read them um, afresh without all of the years and years of stories that we've been told about Genesis uh, layered on them. So I'm really going to encourage you throughout Genesis to practice something called close reading. And this is reading only the words that are on the page and not what we think the text says. And this is a really, really hard thing to do to, to practice close reading, but I'm gonna really encourage you to do it uh, when we do Genesis because there's so many layers of misunderstanding on these texts, okay? Okay, let's start with Genesis 1, 1 through 9. Would someone like to read that one? Just go off mute if you are. Go ahead, Marie. Thank you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Thank you, Marie. Okay, this is something you all have heard this passage so many times, right? So what's the author trying to do? The author is trying to answer, how do we get here? Is there someone or something greater than us? Who made all that I can see? How did existence begin and who began it? And really, really critical for the original audience, the reason they wrote that down. Is my God powerful and capable enough to sustain me in the midst of this exile? That was a critical question. Um, telling the Jewish people that their God is different from the Babylonian gods and their God alone is worthy of worship. So again, context matters. The original audience for this story being written down is those Babylonian exiles who are surrounded by the Babylonian gods and stories of creation. <clears throat> so in Genesis 1-9, the God of Gen Genesis is not a distant deity. Uh, this is a God who is present. And the critical message of the passage is that really God is almighty. Um, and as such is the God of life. And again, remember how critical that would be to that original audience. Something to note is that in this first story of creation, creation comes into being through the spoken word. So creation is <coughs> brought into being through God's spoken word. So go back and look at it here. And God said, let there be light. It is, and so we're going to pay close attention, we're close reading. The verb here is God speaking. God speaks creation into being in this first story. And that's going to be different from the next story we're going to see. So this writing is poetry. This is not a scientific tale. The purpose is not to convey historical or scientific fact, but to tell a story about God. God creates and it is good, told through verse of a poet. So again, and God said, let there be light. God's first words are to call for the light. 
So there's no sun yet. The sun doesn't come until the fourth day. God's first words, let there be light. That's a pretty beautiful way to start a story. Okay, let's go on to uh, the creation of humanity. Genesis 1, 26 to 31. Can someone read this one? I'll read it. Thank you, Diane. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts and the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. So not to belabor a point, but there are two creation stories in Genesis. We're still in the creation story of the poet, right? So this, there's no Adam and Eve here, right? There's no name Colin here. Um, there's no um, uh, rib in this one, right? So that's not here. Um, this is the first story, the poet story. So let's start with this first one. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. So who is us? Uh, this is an interesting dichotomy between Christians and Judaism. Christianity views this as a foreshadowing of the Trinity. Um, <clears throat> that's a very, I think, anti-Jewish understanding um, it is superimposing um, our uh, Christianity onto uh, ancient Israel, uh, Israeli um, sacred writings. Um, so, but that's definitely uh, an understanding. Uh, within Judaism, us refers to the heavenly hosts from whom God takes counsel. It is the divine court. Um, as, uh, as we work our way through the Torah, those first five books of, um, of the Hebrew Bible, you're going to see um, God having companions. And sometimes you'll see God in plural. So you're going to see the evolution of ancient Israel's understanding of God from um, multi-gods to a solo god with a council to um, just plain old god. So that's going to, you're going to see that evolution in the Hebrew scriptures. Here you're seeing God referencing that uh, and God in relationship with that council. Let us do this. Okay. So um, I want to check some of our assumptions and ask, let's talk about the proper translation. So, and God said, um, <clears throat> let me go back and show it to you. Um, God created mankind in his own image. That's our pretty typical understanding of the translation of that. Um, the proper translation is let's make humanity in our image, that it was a non-gender specific word. So in our image, in the likeness of ourselves, so God created humans in the image of God. In the image of God, God created them male and female, God created them. So again, we've, we've been through enough conversations about translations. Um, so what does that mean? God is male and female. So God is not male. God is not female. God is everything between male and female. And God is everything beyond male and female. Now in Judaism, God has no bodily form. So that's not an issue of having gender. 
Uh, in Judaism, it was considered blasphemy to make any image of God um, because God is beyond the imagination of our finite minds, right? Um, making God into a he is uh, reading our sexism into the biblical text. So if all humanity are created in the image of God, then the worth and dignity of all humans are affirmed. So words matter, translations matter. God created humanity. Okay, here's an interesting take on this. And let me just say, the, the amount of content we could spend on just the first two chapters of Genesis is mind blowing. And so I'm trying to call out some things that maybe you haven't heard me preach on or maybe we haven't talked about before. So translation of this word, uh, God created mankind in his own image is an important one. The who is led us creating this collaborative creation. I think that's a that's an interesting one to think about. Um, and then I want to talk about this. Uh, what's the first thing God says? God blesses them and then says, be fruitful and increase in number. So here's a here's a non-traditional understanding of that is that God's first words were instructions to have sex. Now that is a that is not in alignment with much of Christianity's um, body shaming and sex shaming. Um, uh, which is also why I, I really have turned to Jewish biblical scholars and rabbinical sources to draw on for this class, um, because I think we, we need to rethink some of the things that we have taken from our Christian um, thinking on this. So God's first instructions is to humanity is to have sex. Sexual relations are the first gift given to humans by God. Um, and it's a gift that God blesses and declares good. This is really a different understanding than Christian theologians and our, our dear Augustine, who is going to link sex with shame and the expulsion from the garden in the next story. So um, I think this Jewish interpretation really challenges to rethink uh, Christianity's anti-body, anti-sex perspective. God is blessing sex and declaring it good. It is the first uh, blessing that God bestows. Then God goes on and talks about filling the earth and subduing it, ruling over the sea and the birds and all of that. To fill the earth, they have to leave Eden, right? So they can't, in this passage, it's not an issue. They, they, they have to leave Eden to go ahead and do that. Um, this passage has been used for centuries to justify dominion over the natural world. Here's another one where translations matter. The correct translation of the passage is actually not dominion, but instead guardians of the earth. So that's a, a better way to think about that term. So go back to this now. And uh, where is it? Fill the earth and subdue it. So instead of that, it would be uh, be guardians of the earth. Translations matter. Okay. Um, again, I'm going to quote uh, Rabbi Sachs. The first chapter of Genesis, therefore, contains a teaching. It tells us to be creative, namely in three stages. The first is the stage of saying, let there be. The second is the stage, and there was. And the third is the stage of saying, that is good. Implicit in this first chapter is this big challenge. Just as God is creative, so you be creative. That is chapter one. So let me just stop there and check in. Any questions, any comments? Big chapter, so much in there, and we can't cover a lot of it, so... Thoughts, reactions, questions. We keep going. Okay. You know, you have your thing to share at dinner tonight that God's first teaching was to have sex. You, there's something for you to share for Thanksgiving dinner. Okay, I'm going to go back. Back there. 
Okay, let's go into Genesis 2. Um, so Genesis 2, 1 is still the poet. So this is still the first creation story. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. On the seventh day, he rested. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating he had done. <coughs> that is the end of the poet's first creation story. Okay, so time for God to rest and God creates this rhythm of work and rest. And it again concludes with God declaring creation is very good. So there's no differentiating between goodness of God and the wickedness of earth. There's nothing intrinsically evil with the original translation or the original creation. God is standing in solidarity with creation deemed to be very good. That is the first creation story, okay? Again, it's the poet's story. It's the poet's story. Now we're gonna go to the second creation story and talk a little bit about that. And it's gonna be a little bit of a deja vu. This is not the poet's story. This is a different story and it's an older story. So would someone like to read this one? Go ahead, Tony. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden there were the tree of life, and the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so just looking at this introduction, what are people noticing as different from the other version that we read? They created the man first, not the, the both of them together. Yep. And he was made out of the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> created man from the dirt yep and this is it seems more grounded rather than poetic yep so it reads more like a story yeah yep there, there's not an emphasis on one day or another day yep we don't have the division of the days it's it's not the word let there be yep god's not speaking what's what's god doing instead he's working he's planting he put he made mm -hmm. active yeah. verbs right yeah. i think it's interesting that he that the tree of life and the tree of knowledge are are somehow opposites or or in conflict yep. you can't that knowledge knowledge itself is dangerous yeah and so this and this is new this wasn't in the last story right yeah mm -hmm. right i have a question go ahead you started in the beginning about the bible was written down in the 700 bc in the fifth century, yep. So where did all these stories come from? They were stories that had been around for centuries. So just passed down like and plastic cell phones so that it couldn't not all of them are accurate. So let's talk about that. Let me just stop sharing for a second, because this is, I think, is an important question. So the stories of ancient Israel, the stories of David, the Psalms, the hymns 
had been the story of the Exodus, all of those stories had been a part of Israel's tradition, oral tradition, and for centuries and centuries. What happened though, when the Babylonian exile happened is the scribes, the scholars and the clerics were ripped out of Jerusalem, taken away. They saw the entire infrastructure of their religion destroyed. And while they were in exile, they took the time to write those stories down. So what you're seeing though, is, is that there's not a consensus on those stories because there's two stories that made the final cut, right? So it isn't that there's a story of creation that existed in ancient Judaism. It's that there were two stories and that those two stories probably were impacted by all of the other stories surrounding those ancient cultures. So it's very hard to trace the stories back to their origin and said they came from this point in time. We don't know where they come from. We know that they existed as oral traditions and that they wrote them down when they went into exile. We also know that there are a plentitude of stories. So even as we get into uh, further into Genesis, um, we're going to encounter stories that um, duplicate or tell the same stories from different perspectives. We're going to hit that when we come to Abraham. And so, um, which is again, why you need to think of Genesis as a library, not a start to a finish, okay? Does that answer your question, Tony? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about this one. I have a question I could, oh, Marcy. Go ahead, Paul. So he, it talks, it tells about him making man first, but when man is made, the garden, he's already made the garden and he puts man in it. Yep. Okay. And then it talks about the different trees that are in the garden, but then it mentions the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What exactly is the tree of life? Is it all of creation or, or what is it? We don't know. We don't know. And that, that is the tricky part of filling in the details of that and sometimes when we filled in those details they have led to teachings that have led to flourishing and sometimes when we filled in the details those teachings have led to oppression okay yeah uh do we do we know when that um those particular words tree of life when those first appeared in written form or did that go through multiple translations and who knows what it really was in the beginning? Who, who are you asking? I was asking Marcy or anybody. <laughs> Marcy, you're muted, I think. Is she frozen? No. Okay, can you hear me now? Now we can. Yes, right. I hate technology. <laughs> no, surely we don't know where those first appeared. We just know that they show up in Genesis. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is clearly a different author, right? Uh, most scholars think this is the older version. So this is about 400 years older than the first one. Um, Genesis 1, poetry, song, this one reads like a story, right? And the order is going to be very different. The second creation story is not about creating the universe. It is about creating humanity and meeting humanity's needs, right? And this is what you all picked up. God doesn't speak. God makes. These are active words, God is also intimately involved in this story. So uh, God is up walking around and uh, conversing with humanity. Okay, let's read this one. This is the tricky one. This is the one where I really want you to practice close reading because, oh my gosh, so many things we think are in this story. They just are not there. Who wants to take a stab at reading this one?
Uh, I will. I... Thanks, Shirley. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of a man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Thanks, Shirley. Okay, so this version is asking why do I exist to partner with God on the task of maintaining the integrity of the planet. So it begins by God telling man not to eat the tree. So the original instructions don't go to man and woman. They only go to the man. And then God recognized the man is alone and needs a relationship, right? So this is a beautiful insight that um, uh, the man needs a companion. Um, God is portrayed not as speaking, but as more of an artist. So God creates the wild beasts and the birds and then decides to create a woman from the same flesh as the man. So God isn't speaking things into being, God is creating. Now the Hebrew text of that word helper um, comes from the Hebrew root word meaning support or help. So in the original Jewish translation, there is no implication of subordination or inferiority for the one doing the helping. So nowhere in the original text does that imply subordination. Uh, a better translation would be the word companion. So if you go back to this, um, no suitable helper was found. It was no suitable companion was found. Again, God looked at man, saw that man was alone, Wanted God wanted man to be in relationship and found a companion. So that's a better translation of the original Hebrew. Um, <clears throat> this is a Jewish understanding of this act of creation is as a circle, not as a beginning and as end. The circle is closed with the creation of the woman. It's not an afterthought, but as a culmination of the creative act. It's a beautiful way to think of it. Not a first and a second, but creation of humanity begins with the man and the circle is closed when the woman is created. Uh, this is important to, to note here. The man doesn't have any role in the creation of woman. It is solely a divine act. So go back and again, we read it. Um, God puts man in a deep sleep. And while the man is sleeping, God removes the rib and um, creates the woman. It is solely a divine act, right? So God creates woman from a man's side for the first and only time man births a woman. So uh, these verses we know have been used for centuries to subjugate women. Um, I could give you instance after instant of Christian theologian who have used these, this uh, verse of, to demonstrate the um, superiority of male and the inferiority of female. I'm going to encourage you to put it all aside. And I love this Jewish thinking of this act as a creative um, circle of creation. I think that's a beautiful way to think about it. 
Now, um, I'm, before we break for just a second here, I just want to do a little sidebar. Um, some of you may have heard of Lilith. And um, Lilith comes from the story we just read. And it's an ancient tradition that imagined that Adam had two wives. And the first wife, the one that was created out of Adam's rib, was Lilith. Now, um, and actually not, not the created out of ribs, Adam's rib, it was before then. So since she was created at the same time as Adam, tradition has it, she demanded total equity and she refused to submit to Adam and Adam refused her demand. So Lilith left. Uh, the story goes then that God sent the angels after Lilith to get her to return, but she refused. So the anger, the angels cursed her and her offspring and Lilith vowed to prey on women in labor in their, who were in labor in their babies. So for a long time, Whenever a woman had a stillborn child, Lilith was to blame Adam's first wife. Lilith shows up only once in the biblical text, and it's in Isaiah 34. So Lilith, over time, is going to evolve to be the basically the grandmother of the devil and the patroness of witches. But here's where it comes from, is that first story right there. It is a reimagining um, that came into tradition of Adam's first wife. Okay, um, let's do this. I was going to send you into small groups. I'm going to still do it. The question is, is uh, as you start to read um, Genesis, what are you um, leaving behind or maybe finding anew? Okay, uh, let me do this real quick. Okay, I'm going to send you all into your rooms for about seven minutes just to talk about uh, what you, and I'll put it in the chat too, what you're finding anew in Genesis from your own study and what you're leaving behind. Go ahead. Okay, final thoughts, comments, anything you want to share from your breakout groups? Go ahead, Diane. I'm going to I'm going to keep the poets part in my Bible, and I might have to just rip out the, the rest <laughs> because we're talking. That's all I was taught was the second part, right? Over yeah. and over and over again. And I I know the first part was probably read on Christmas or something, but never heard a word. So I'm going to keep that one, that second part, mentally. That Lilith explanation was amazing. Yeah. I'm so not sure I've heard ever about, heard that. Heard, yeah, how many of you heard about Lilith's Fair when it was touring? Yes. That, was, that was the basis of Lilith's Fair. <laughs> but, there, but there really is no mention of her, is there? There is in Isaiah. There's one mention. It's a reference to her, yeah. But not in this story. Not, not in, in this story, no. No, but this is where she comes in in the story and tradition. So somehow she was talked about and passed down through the ages. Yes. Bernie, Bernie mentioned that Lilith was the first wife of Frazier. <laughs> first wife of Frazier. Frazier's <laughs> wife was Lilith. Oh, yeah. oh. That's true. Yeah. 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 
Mm -hmm. Lil Lilith has a character on Lucifer. So. Yeah, now you know the basis of where that name is coming from. It's it's quite deliberate when it's used, yeah. both in a misogynistic way and in feminist reclaiming it way. Yes. Yeah. What? Uh, Go ahead, Bernie. Uh, what book did you say Lilith is mentioned in again? She's Lilith. in Isaiah. Isaiah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's the only mention in the Bible of her. Marcy, off topic, what time are you at church tomorrow? I'm going to be there from probably about 8.30 to 5. So it's a good time to drop. Should I call before dropping off a bag of groceries? I'll be there all day. So I'll have it open. So yeah, if you're going to be after 3, let call me or text me. But other than that, I'll be there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye, everybody. I got to go. Bye, Chuck. Bye, Bye, Chuck. Bye, Chuck. Okay, so next week we're going to do chapters three and four. It's going to get a little turbulent. Now, chapter three and four, chapter three is the serpent story. And that one I really, really want you to read closely. So really yeah. read it slowly. Notice what words are there, what words aren't there and really try to put off all the things that you've heard about that story and just read the words on the page. And uh, and I think it's gonna be an interesting discussion next week. And I care if we get into Cain and Abel and the kids, I think we do, which is a, it's a hard story. So we'll tackle that one too. Go ahead, Bernie. One quick question. I'm still reading the King James version. Is Bernie? that different? <laughs> You want me to get a new Bible. I know. I do. Right. I do. I want to send you a new Bible. Um, the, no, the NSRV, right. yeah, the NSRV, the new version is really, I mean, a lot of research went into that one. It goes back to the, the core original translations. Um, so um, I would, if, you, if you're looking in the market to, for a new Bible, NSRV would be the one to do. All right, thank you. Julie, <laughs> buy Bernie a Bible for Christmas. I know Bernie <laughs> loves that King James one. <laughs> I thought it was my father's or my grandfather's or something. I don't know. Well, of course, I have my father's great one too. Yeah. I just <laughs> I have one, <clears throat> one last request for any of you in Seattle. I need to track down two copies of the Seattle Times for today for Liz's obituary, mm -hmm. and there are none in Monroe. You have I, one? Yeah, I cut it out so I can give you a copy of it where you can I make a copy and you can have the original. I'll Perfect. drop it. I'll drop I it off. I have a copy too, and I'll be over tomorrow, Marcy. I'll be oh, over in the morning. Perfect. I'll stick it in my uh, bag right now. Okay. All right. Perfect. If I could have two originals, Laura and Louisa both wanted a written original. Do they, they want the whole paper or just the obituary? Just the obituary. Okay, I'll drop okay. mine off too, Marcy. Okay, thank you, everybody. I'll see you later. Nice thank to you. see you, Shirley. Bye. Bye. Nice Bye. to see you, Shirley. Thank you. Bye.